Okay, I think we can probably get started. We've got a pretty good crowd here, and people seem to have stopped uh, drifting in. So, you know, first of all, a little bit about me. I'm Gordon Half. Uh, wrote a cloud book earlier this year, and these are all the various ways you can get hold of me. Um, these slides, as I understand, will be up on the uh, will be up on the Linux Foundation website, and I. It's also my well, not quite New Year's resolution at this point, but it's one of my resolutions to get more recorded versions of my various presentations up on, uh, on my website. So there should be some version of this up there. So my sort of the, the origin of this talk is the sort of link baity headlines that you see out there. There's nobody from the media here, is there? No, my friends from the media. Okay, so um, that... Um, that uh, people write, or that maybe their editors write, that sort of every time something or other vaguely connected to cloud computing goes wrong, we have these headlines, you know, is it safe? The cloud isn't safe. And you mean public cloud, but, you know, just sort of broadly. By the way, does anybody get the movie reference here? Anyone? Marathon Man, go see it, it's very good. Um, so, I mean, I, so basically the genesis of this talk is that you, you have this, these headlines, sort of, the cloud isn't safe, you know, these very broad brush statements about, um, you know, about whether you should use cloud computing, public cloud computing specifically. And we're unfortunately having some slight weirdnesses with the, um, with the resolution, I guess. But what this slide said, would say, if you could see the whole thing, would be safety in this context really means a number of different things. It means sort of in the same sort of things you think about when you think about bank safe, actually, and you know, sort of the integrity of what you have there, uh, whether other people can get at it, uh, privacy, uh, you know, continuity as, you know, sort of trust that your money just isn't going to like not be there any longer someday. And I think the term that we see used most often or that, that sort of mashed up with security most often is security. And so I think when we see surveys, for example, about cloud computing, you know, what was the biggest inhibitor to cloud computing? Security is almost always at, to at the top there. Yeah, that tends to be how people answer. I'd actually argue that today this is a little bit less the case than it was historically, but you still see that at the top of surveys a lot. And the problem is, in another movie reference, that secure, I think a lot of people who say that security is an inhibitor to cloud, it, it doesn't mean what they think it means, or they don't mean what they, you know, what they think they're saying because they're really not meaning by and large security in the sense of Amazon doesn't know how to configure their routers or their firewalls. I mean, that's not what they normally mean. It doesn't mean that Amazon or most big public cloud providers don't know how to properly salt and hash passwords and that kind of thing. But really they rather have concerns about a broader range of topics and that's really kind of what the subject of my talk today is going to be. What are the broader range of topics? Uh, how, are, you know, how, how are some of these things maybe a little different from computing historically? And frankly, how are they the, really the same as they've been historically? You know, if anybody here is really kind of a, a IT governance, compliance you know, expert, or at least are very familiar with those kind of issues, those kind of concerns in IT. Frankly, a lot of this is going to be very familiar to you that I talk about today. Um, what, one of the reasons I talk about, though, is, you know, first of all, as I said, I think a lot of these topics get very stereotyped. The other is that, I think for a lot of people, just getting into cloud computing, you know, kind of from the grounds up, some of these IT governance topics may not be as familiar. And you know, this is Chris Hoff. He's uh, many of you may may have heard of him or know him. Uh, he's with Juniper these days, and 
uh, very outspoken, there will be another quote from him later in this talk, that security isn't a red herring, nor is it an 800-pound gorilla in the sense that it's the problem with public cloud computing. Um, it, it really isn't security, it's these other types of issues, and those are what I'm going to focus on today. So, what was new, what isn't new? I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the certifications that we see around public cloud providers. So if you're thinking about picking a public cloud, you know, these are some of the things you, you might start thinking about. And then I'm going to take us through at some level of detail uh, something called the Cloud Control Matrix from the Cloud Security Alliance. And there's a number of these types of documents out there. And I have a slide at the end that offers up some of them that you can take a look at in more detail uh, offline. But it kind of walks you through a lot of these concerns at a very detailed level. So what is new? Um, you know, I say a lot of things aren't new, but I'd argue there are some things that are a bit new about cloud computing, especially about public cloud computing, although I'd argue some of this also applies to in-house IT. Um, the first is this idea of shared responsibility. Uh, and where if you have an application running on a public cloud, or really in a cloud provider period, because this provider could actually be your own IT department or somebody you've contracted to run your IT. And the idea here is for these different levels of abstraction, and I'll talk a little more about those in the next slide, infrastructure, platform, software. With each of these, you, at some level, and, and the, these are, you know, don't, don't get too wrapped up in exactly where these lines are, but you'll kind of, as you move from infrastructure as a service up to software as a service, you are at some level increasingly trusting your provider to do certain things right. And they may not, in many cases, even tell you exactly how they're taking care of all those things. But at some level, you have to trust them that they are. And there are, as I'll get into, various certifications which relate to audit and so forth that might give you some uh, peace of mind there. But there is this, you know, there is this sort of, uh, you know, demarcation between what the provider does and what you do. Do. And, you know, to flip things around, um, you know, if you're running your application on Amazon, you know, and, you know, you've written an application, you're running in their infrastructure as a service, and, you know, they're taking care of this stuff down here, there's obviously still lots of security things that you could mess up. Uh, and even as you kind of move, you know, kind of move up the stack, there are security and compliance and uh, user privacy things that you know you're absolutely perfectly capable of messing up, even if the provider is doing everything they promise to do properly. Properly, and many of you are familiar with with this probably. So infrastructure as a service, platforms as a service, software as a service. Um, it's not a perfect categorization in, for clouds, and I'd argue that you you tend to get some blurring at the boundaries here. Um, and in fact, you know, there's a certain school of thought that some of these things like platforms of service and infrastructure of service may even merge together over time. But, but you kind of have these different levels of abstraction. And one of the things I think is different about cloud computing, as opposed to the case historically, you're making greater use of these abstractions and you're deliberately, by design, hiding some things and making them the provider's responsibility than was the historic norm. And yeah, we did this to some degree with, and do it to some degree with hosting providers and the like, but I'd argue cloud computing has this sort of more deliberate and more explicit abstraction model than was the historical case. I'd also argue the other thing that's different, certainly in degree, and uh, probably to a sufficient degree that's really a difference in kind, is this whole idea of, you know, self-service for everything, uh, stuff happening very rapidly, um, the fact that you, you can get access to resources so quickly, and, you know, you're not going through a 
you know, a five-step paper-based approval process to get compute resources or access to some type of resource. And I, I would argue that that creates certain differences that affect compliance and security and things like that. And, you know, just kind of maybe almost bringing all of that together more broadly, we, we've kind of moved from, <clears throat> excuse me, we kind of moved from having these, you know, applications, you know, IT resources and so forth that, that were these fairly monolithic IT controlled to this much more loosely coupled set of distributed applications and, you know, with these different types of service abstractions and running across hybrid environments, so both in-house IT and various types of public cloud resources. And I think if you kind of step back and, you know, from the details and look at the picture as a whole, that does, I think, tend to create a new set of concerns or certainly a heightened set of concerns to deal with. But not everything changes, as I said, and the very quotable Chris Hoff to return to him. And for this audience, um, I decided I didn't need to censor Chris's uh, quote. And that is, if your security practices suck in the physical realm, you'll be delighted by the surprising lack of change when you move to the cloud. Uh, and I mean, I actually really like the, this quote because besides um, the fact that I, you know, it kind of comes out a little strong here because I think there's a huge amount of truth to it. I mean, I, I think you have this assumption of it's the cloud, so everything is different. And in fact, a huge amount of stuff, I think for reasons I just said, I think some things are bigger problems, some things are probably lesser problems. Uh, with a public cloud, uh, you know, you can assume if you're using a big public cloud provider that they probably have some pre-competent people who are kind of doing some of the basic security blocking and tackling and backups and things like that. You know, not say they can't screw up, but frankly, they're probably better than most smaller organizations particularly have in-house. Uh, but because of this loose loose coupling and because of this self-service other concerns are probably heightened. Um, so I, one thing I will mention partly because I'm in Europe here is because I definitely get questions when I talk about cloud security practices and I'll mention this and then move on but there is something called ITIL which is probably more used in Europe than in the US in IT departments, at least explicitly. And basically this is an idea, the idea, basic idea behind ITIL is it's providing guidance on generating a strategy uh, to more of a service delivery. Uh, again, this idea of not delivering applications but delivering services, perhaps self-service services to, to users. And a lot of this uh, sort of dovetails with some of the changes that we're making that we're making in cloud. I mean, ITIL existed before before cloud. Uh, I think it's it and some of its sort of sister type of process sets have been denigrated with you know greater or lesser degrees of fairness as being you know these kind of big manuals filled with procedures and processes and so forth. Um, but I think having said that, some of the ideas of some of the things we need to look at as we go to cloud computing in terms of we have to automate ruthlessly, we really need to standardize a lot of things, even if they're being done in a lighter weight way than was historically the norm here, I think these basic concepts are pretty valid. Um, and you know, another thing that, is, that still very much applies as we, as we talk about cloud computing is you know, some of the fundamental uh, sort of frameworks or the way approaches that we take when we start thinking about risk. This is from actually another European, uh, Inissa, um, that came out with this report of, I think about a couple years ago now maybe, looking at some of the risks associated with specific cloud computing. And basically what they did was for this whole set of risks, and if you're interested, this is why the one of the kind of frameworks reports I'd suggest 
at least skimming through in detail, was that you know you have this idea of you have you know you have risk X, and I'll actually show you a specific example here, which is compliance challenges. And for each of these, well, first of all, how big a deal is it if you mess up here or if there's a problem here? And they say, well, compliance is, you know. That's pretty big. That's pretty big risk. Um, you know, bad things happen. Lawyers get involved. You don't want lawyers getting involved if you can possibly avoid it. Does anyone here want lawyers to get involved? No. So, don't want that to happen. But you know, even if it's a big risk, you know, yeah. I mean, if a meteorite hits your data center, you know, that's pretty bad. Uh, how likely is that to happen? Well, not so much. In the case of compliance, they say actually the probability, given all these regulations and guidelines involved, is actually pretty high. So, you know, going back to that previous chart, well, that's down here, that's down in the red. So that's something we ought to pay attention to. You know, if, you know, the, the meteorite, you know, well, that's probably over here somewhere. So, you know, may, maybe we don't spend a lot of time worrying about what we do. Maybe we worry about other events that might wipe out our data center, you know, particularly if we're in a flood, you know, flood prone area or something. And again, this is just kind of an approach, you know, as any of you have done anything with security and compliance, you, you can eliminate, the bottom line here is you can not eliminate risk. Everything I'm talking about here is about mitigating risk and you really need to spend your time where you're going to have the biggest impact. So, certifications. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in this um, because it's kind of boring, frankly. But just to make you aware that there are various regulations and certifications out there, uh, certifications related to regulations. Depending upon your industry, some of these may be more important than others. One that you probably will hear a lot mentioned is something called SAS 70. And I think it's sort of the last few years have kind of been taken, oh, you know, that's something you need to have as a cloud provider. It actually doesn't tell you an awful lot. It was really created essentially for financial auditors. So it sort of has to do with, you know, kind of the business reliability at some level of the organization, but it's actually less to do with some of the other things you might care about in, uh, in IT. Um, this is the, the um, ISO IEC 27001. Uh, that's actually sort of relevant in the UK. Uh, PCI DSS primarily relates to if you're processing credit cards. Um, FedRAMP is actually a very big deal uh, in the US for the federal government. In fact, that was kind of the first uh, sort of government-wide set of requirements and standards around uh, security and related items in cloud. So that's kind of big. Then HIPAA uh, is effectively confidentiality of, of uh, patient health care records and so forth in the US. Um, this is SOC 2, SOC 3 is really the first, um, I would say, very explicitly public cloud provider focus set of certifications. It's mostly in the US today. It does seem to be getting some traction. Um, it's type two is sort of suitability of design effectiveness. Uh, SOC 3 is essentially a condensed public version. SOC 2 is something that a provider will release uh, you know, essentially under non-disclosure to potential customers. Uh, SOC 3 is really kind of a stripped down version of that. Um, the SOC, SOC 2 and to a lesser degree SOC 3, those do seem to be getting some traction. So again, if you're looking at certifications, this is a very quick review, but these are some of the things you might think about. What I'm going to spend the, you know, kind of most of the rest of this talk on is going through something called the Cloud Security Alliance's Cloud Controls Matrix. And this and, and then there's some other kind of variants of this that other organizations have. And if you, you know, you really want to think about, uh, you, you know, you know, whether or not it's your direct job or just something you all think about as a developer or whoever, um, it's really worth 
reading through one of these things. And you know, it may not be the most exciting literature you've ever read in your life, but I, I think it's actually really useful for thinking through actually all the you know, kind of all the areas and all the sub areas that create risk in an IT organization, including things that you maybe had never really thought of as connected to IT. So, you know, in the case of the CCM, you've got 11 categories of things and 98 quote unquote control areas that span those 11 categories. Um, so here, here's one example of one of those control areas. So security architecture, production, and non-production environments. You know, it has a definition. You know, what, do, what do I mean by that particular control area? And basically, those two things ought to be separated from each other. And what the CSA cloud controls matrix does is it actually maps each of these uh, control areas to a set of the of applicable regulations slash certifications to apply to them. You know, who does this affect? Is it the provider or is it the user of the service? Um, and you know, it, and you know, but, but, yeah. So, so that's the service provider, and that can be an internal service provider, or an external, or the consumer slash tenant. And then also, which does this apply to infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, or software as a service? So it's really, you know, it's a, it's a very kind of formal, methodical look through these different areas. And I always hate it when speakers say, you probably can't read this from the back of the room, but I just want you, it's a, basically it's a big um, spreadsheet and it goes through kind of each of these areas. So there's the specification, you know, whether it's relevant to corporate governance, the SAS, PaaS, IAS, service provider, consumer, and then, you know, in this case, DSS and uh, uh, some of the other regulations that apply. So it, you know, there's basically 98 lines down here. And that's why I said it doesn't really make scintillating reading. But I mean, I, I certainly find it very useful as a way to really kind of go to get away from kind of very simplistic views of risk management in the cloud. These are the 11 domains, and I'll just point, you can read through them, compliance, data governance, and you know, there are things in here like facility security that you know, may not be that relevant to you as developers, but they're all part of um, you know, an overall IT governance plan, you know, human resources. You know, if, you know, if somebody leaves the company, you know, how does that get tied in to your identity management systems, for example? Um, so I'm going to go, go kind of through these. Uh, compliance, uh, not, not all of them, but uh, just talk about some of the things that are probably kind of some of the, uh, you know, kind of the items that you're most likely run into and are probably most relevant from an IT operations or a, uh, or a developer point of view. So, you know, compliance, you know, a lot of this is about having audit controls in place. Um, this is actually an interesting one because in my view, a lot of the concerns about public cloud security are really not necessarily issues with how they do certain things. It's really more with not having visibility into how they do things and not having control, direct control over, for example, if they get a subpoena for your data, are they going to tell you about what's their notification process? So I think this is actually kind of a big deal. And in fact, if we look at some public cloud providers out there, um, I think Verizon that may be a good example of this. They're, um, one of the ways they're kind of um, distinguishing themselves is giving their customers more access to, to audit logs and things like that than somebody like Amazon is willing to give. So this is actually an area of potential differentiation providers. Um, and I'm going to talk about data in a bit more detail, but the regulatory mapping, uh, you know, essentially, you know, is there a rule in, you know, France, for example, about 
certain types of data not being able to travel across borders. And there's a number of regulations like this around, around the world. I did a whole podcast with a lawyer a few months ago on the topic. And really kind of understanding what you need to do in order to be compliant, especially around data. Um, and data ends up being probably, we keep coming back to data here, and there, there certainly are a lot of things about how you store passwords and, and stuff like that, and you know, provisioning your employees and things like that. But you know, if you kind of peel back the covers a little bit, the biggest concerns for, uh, for around compliance and corporate governance tend to be data, um, especially customer data, because that tends to be where it really intersect the law of privacy laws and the like. Um, one of the keys of, kind of how you approach this is, is really classifying it. You know, there, there's a lot of data out there. A lot of that data is not going to be particularly sensitive. So, you know, and this kind of comes back to kind of the, triage, the triaging I alluded to earlier is really kind of pulling out, you know, what's the data I really need to be careful of. Um, you know, there's a mention, one of the control areas, retention and secure disposal policies. So what does that mean? Well, it means ensuring data is not recoverable by any computer forensic means. And I think as an industry, we've gotten better about this over, you know, the last 10, 20 years or so. But, you know, b before we had the cloud isn't safe, headline you know we had headlines where you know somebody had dumped a dumpster full of uh, magnetic tape with customer re you know customer names customer records on them and you know they're big scandal and so forth so i think we've gotten better about that but it's still important and you know do you have controls in place in a multi-tenant type of environment so w one of the things that again, talk about differences from traditional computing, is a little bit different, is you have a lot more multiple customers running on a single physical server, and you know, what are the mechanisms that you use to separate? One of the things we've done at Red Hat here in our OpenShift platforms of service, for example, is to use SE Linux uh, policies, labeling, in order to provide that extra level of protection against isolation. And uh, you know, a lot of this stuff is frankly not technology that I'm talking about here, it's process and the like, but there certainly are pieces of technology that we can use to uh, I, I, you know, give that extra little protection in cases. Um, information security, you know, I'd say a lot of this is not necessarily technology. And I think that's sort of highlighted here. So in the case of the, this particular item, IS01, there is a requirement for a management program. So you know, having, detail, you know, having documented processes, uh, safeguards to protect assets and data from you know, unauthorized access, disclosure, uh, alteration, destruction. Um, Another big thing in general is identity and access control. And this is interesting as it ties into a lot of those other areas like, like human resources. You know, having the right uh, group policies and so forth. And you know, that's why like, you know, having timely identity information. So again, you know, th this does things, you know, this relates to things like deprovisioning you know, immediately when somebody no longer has access. And theoretically, again, in the kind of the more traditional monolithic IT, um, this was, well, I won't say it was easy. It probably took us a long time as an industry to get this reasonably right. But you know, if you only had to change things in one place, that was pretty straightforward. As we talk about cloud with the with you know kind of a law of federated resources or loosely connected having identity management systems that can handle that sort of distributed framework are increasingly important. And, you know, it's really important. Um, actually, our identity manage, management product manager um, 
asked me to, to make a particular plug for this item uh, because she feels it's really critical. It is still evolving, I'd say, for cloud use cases. You know, I think we've, we, you know, we, we were kind of getting it right in more monolithic systems, and now clouds kind of made it harder again. Um, so continuing here, this is probably going to, you know, particularly with various events of recent months, I think uh, probably going to be a lot more discussion of encryption going on. And obviously, you know, encryption at some level is easy, but key, the key management is the hard part. Uh, and, you know, I think we'll have to see how that plays out. But, uh, you know, I, I expect we're going to see a lot more requirements for encryption as time goes on. Um, you know, instant, kind of instant response. This is, I guess, kind of risk management 101, but it's an important piece. And, you know, even having things like what are the acceptable use policies and, and what happens when there's violations of acceptable use policies. So these, these all kind of factor in here. Um, Security so security architecture is another uh, is another big piece that quite a bit of time in the cloud controls matrix goes into. Um, so you know what are the minimum standards for user and password uh, controls? Um, interestingly, uh, the the CCM mandates multi-factor authentication for all uh, for for all remote access. Um, you know, password, uh, passwords are an utter and complete mess. And uh, Tim Bray at Google, among others, has given some very compelling talks about kind of why passwords are just a broken system. And uh, I'm, I'm seeing another red hatter shaking his head vigorously in the back row. Uh, and I mean, I, I think we're going to have to do something about this as an industry. but. You know, as a near term, multi-factor authentication is, you know, it, it's something. It's, it's, it's better, than, better than what we have. And it, it's really is a good idea to take advantage of it where, you know, where it's available. Because, uh, you know, I, I've been reading some really scary articles recently, you know, about, uh, you know, the, sort of the bad guys are, or, you know, or researchers who, Presumably, the bad guys are doing the same thing as the researcher. You know, mining, you know, Gutenberg, mining Wikipedia, mining the Bible for like word combinations, uh, and just building up these bigger and bigger dictionaries to do dictionary attacks. And this article, I think it may have been in the New York Times recently, kind of went through what to me was really some pretty mind boggling you know, how these word combinations that you think, wow, that's a really primo grade A password. And it's in dictionaries to attack passwords with. Um, so so I, think, I think that's kind of a big deal. Um, segmenting, uh, segmenting networks between trusted and untrusted. Um, one of the things that's, one of the trends that's kind of interesting in public clouds right now that serve in this vein is, uh, a concept called virtual private clouds is actually becoming quite popular, which basically is the idea here is you're using a public cloud, but you set up this virtual private cloud, which, uh, which gives you some additional control over, the, over isolating the subnets and so forth that you're using. And in fact, uh, something like Amazon's GovCloud uh, requires a virtual private cloud. Uh, some of the things that we, uh, we offer uh, at Red Hat uh, through our certified cloud provider program, some of the kind of the update services for, for RHEL and so forth, we have customers using a virtual private cloud that you're connecting to uh, through a VPN for that. So I, this seems to be one area that people are kind of using to, to kind of get a little bit greater control over a public cloud as opposed to just using an arbitrary, um, uh, sort of an arbitrary multi-tenant situation. Um, these are some sources. Um, I don't expect you to write those down. As I say, the slides, um, the slides are going to be up on, uh, will be up in the Linux Foundation site. And I'm going to put some stuff on my own blog about this as well. Um, the Deloitte Cloud Computing Risk Intelligence Map is this nice big, 
Well, if you have it in paper, big fold out thing, but if you don't have it in paper, you just have it in PDF, it goes through from an auditor's perspective what a lot of the risks associated with cloud computing are. And it's, it's a very, very good read. Um, <coughs> the, the, you know, I, I meant, you know, I've been talking at length about the Cloud Security Alliance, Cloud Controls Matrix, um, the CSIS, Tway Critical Security Controls, uh, is also a good document going through kind of a similar type of thing. If, uh, in fact, if you um, assume they'll have some new presentations at Amazon reInvent next month in November in Las Vegas, but there's actually, you can go up and do, do some searching and like Amazon reInvent and security presentation or something like that. And there were some very good uh, presentations given by Amazon folks last year that go, that basically take these security controls and talk about them in Amazon context. And in fact, that's some of the inspiration for me to, to give this talk. So there's a, there's a lot of good information out there and, you know, certainly my goal today has, you know, kind of not been to, you know, turn everyone here into a risk compliance or a security expert, but, you know, really, you know, taking you folks who I'm sure all have, you know, some, some, you know, at least some familiarity with security and other aspects of risk management in IT. And maybe, you know, maybe by broadening your horizons a little bit to some of the things that you might want to look at in kind of a broader look at risk management in your organization. Um, you know, and I think one point I'm making, this is, you know, my, my sort of one and only slight commercial uh, here, but uh, kind of using a picture of kind of the Red Hat portfolio plus our partners to just sort of send a message here that what you're doing here is kind of not a product specific type of thing or some segment of your infrastructure specific thing. But, you know, it's looking at the infrastructure. So, you know, I talked about things like you know, SE Linux for multi-tenant security, for example, and, you know, maybe using virtual private clouds in your, in your public cloud provider. And some cloud providers actually even let you uh, have dedicated servers. Uh, making decisions over whether you run you run things in house or whether you run them in a public cloud. Um, you know, having hybrid management on top of that, and some of that is, you know, again, enforcing policy about where things run, uh, is also with, um, you know, something like Red Hat Satellite, is about automating things, um, you know, having drift detection for configurations, uh, you know, being, you know, so, so basically having, being able to set up policies and configurations to, you know, to, deal, to deal with patching, to deal with changes that could affect security. Now, I think overall, you know, automation is a huge part of you know, what we're kind of talking about here because if, you know, it's kind of the traditional way of doing things by hand, uh, th there's just no way that you can do security manually at this kind of scale. You, you have to be able to automate it with, with the appropriate tools. And, you know, again, go, going back to the very thing, what's different about cloud computing, I think one of the differences, which I didn't mention and maybe should have, is just the scale at which so much of this is happening. And, it, it, you know, I argue, you know, we, we could argue that, you know, historically, we should have done all these things. We should have automated all this, you know, have proper, you know, golden images, that kind of thing. In practice, I think we could often get away with it most of the time uh, because, because it, you know, the whole scale was small enough that we could. But with, with cloud computing, you know, in terms of, you know, data management, you know, automatic classification, you know, again, being able to handle things in an automated way, you absolutely have to. Um, and, um, you know, but really kind of the bigger message is you, you kind of have to think about this as your IT as a whole, as opposed to, oh, you know, we're doing th this c compliance stuff in this one little piece, because I, I didn't include any of them in this talk, but, one of the real themes that we see from talking to both our customers and analysts is this idea of hybrid IT. They are moving towards this idea of having these distributed 
uh, services that are coming together from a bunch of different places. And you really then need to manage that hybrid IT as a whole. So hopefully that has been helpful. And I, we have a few minutes for any questions. Uh, yes. Yeah. And what I'm trying to figure is who is caring really about these issues? How much have they been looked at and how much is that do people actually believe that this is being solved? Are the people who are using cloud today doing so in ignorance of these questions or have they actually looked at the questions and are satisfied that cloud offerings today are good enough? Because this 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 I, agree, I basically agree with you. Um, I think, you know, and I think certainly one of the things that we are trying to, so I'll, I'll say a few different things. Uh, you know, one is, I think one of the things we're trying to do with platforms of service, for example, is to sort of expose, is sort of to show developers that really fast self-service and multi-language, multi-framework and all that kind of good stuff while having control over the underlying infrastructure and you know being again you know remembering back to the you know kind of shared responsibility you know developer has to do some things right but a lot of the underlying infrastructure can kind of be taken care of there um, I think one so I think go, you know, before you know, let's call it a year ago um, I think the answer in terms of the kind of public cloud, private cloud slash private infrastructure, I think the answer in a Fortune 500 type of company was we simply don't use public cloud or at least we don't use it for anything that is kind of part of our sort of official infrastructure. You know, certainly our systems of record. What we're starting to see in the last year or so uh, are things like the virtual private cloud and the gov cloud from Amazon and so forth. So I, we're starting to see those efforts to bring them together. Um, I, I, I agree with your basic point, though, that there's, there's absolutely a tension here. And I think one of the, you know, kind of one of the goals from, you know, the kind of from, from both IT at customers and commercial vendors like you know one we work for is working with people to you know to kind of balance those things you know how do you sort of keep the stuff that's good about public cloud and rapid self-service and all that while at the same time um, you, know, me, you know meeting sort of the IT and chief security officer and so forth requirements. And one of the ways companies are doing that in many cases is, you know, we like all that cloud stuff, but we're going to run it ourselves. And, I, you know, I, and I, I think over time, more people, A, more people are going to get more comfortable about public clouds. And I think you're going to have public cloud providers like Verizon, perhaps, who do who are willing to go that extra mile to to give enterprise customers kind of the features or the visibility or audibility that they at least think they need. That yes. Uh, a bit a question relating to the to uh, talks this morning. Yeah. I mean, the, like cloud care has already been abated when the prism stuff right. came out, and I think this really needs to trust. Even if it's not like really, it does need to trust or the public cloud providers 
how do you see this affecting the whole cloud adaptation? Well, first of all, I, 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 you know, I think headlines that you know this, you know this, you know, um, you know is a huge blow to pub, you know to public cloud computing. I, I don't really agree with that. Uh, I think it is going to make people think about stuff like encryption and so forth. Uh, and uh, you know, it, you know, sort of if you kind of assume. You know, people are watching, whoever those people may be. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, I, I think people will, will have to decide, you know, kind of what they're comfortable with. And, and as I say, there may be some things uh, like, encry you know, like encryption that are relatively well understood and easy to do, and people just start doing more broadly. I think having said that, I think it remains to be seen to what degree the people in the mainstream really care about a lot of this stuff. And, you know, we might, you know, we, we can argue kind of in this room whether they should care or not. I, I think the evidence so far is by and large, you know, they don't. And, you, you know, and yeah, I mean, do we really want as a, you know, kind of a society for folks like Google to have that much at least potential visibility into things that we do? Well, I think the answer is a lot of people don't care about it. And, you know, at some level, kind of, sure, you can just cut your connection to the internet and kind of go live in, uh, you know, go live up in the you know, wilds of Alaska or something. But, you know, that's not a very practical answer for most people. So I, I probably didn't really answer your question. But I think, I think there probably are some relatively simple things that we might decide give us one extra level of protection, but um, but uh, yeah, I mean it's not mo certainly it's not mostly a technology thing, and I and I think we're going to continue to see adoption in any case. I, I think that the, the question is less do people care? It's do people care about it enough to either pay more for a different solution or suffer inconvenience for a less joint up solution that the current yeah. solution? Yeah, I mean, you, you can run your own server, you know, rather than using Gmail. And believe me, on our corporate mail, internal corporate mailing list, these, this, these discussions come up every now and then, um, uh, you know, where, you know, oh, how many people out there are still running their own mail server? And some, you know, some people do, and, and I absolutely, you know, will fight for people to have that choice. But most won't. Any other questions? Well, thank you all for um, taking a late lunch to, uh, to, uh, to see this, and I hope it's been helpful. And as I say, uh, these slides will be up there, and I should have some more of this with my travel over for the fall, mostly uh, get some more of this up on my website. So thank you all.